Thanks for staying with us. Welcome back to Business Edge. Before we head to our next conversation, let's bring you up to speed on our top international headlines. Now, carrying more stock, uh, switching to suppliers uh, nearer to consumers and reducing dependence on China are tactics European and U.S. retailers use to build more resilient supply chains following disruptions during the COVID-19 pandemic. A face now with transport delays of two weeks or more as cargo ships have rerouted from the Red Sea. They've limited the uh, financial wiggle room to splurge on work workarounds like air freight that would get products into stores faster. A surge in inflation since the pandemic has also caused the shoppers around the world to cut back on spending, uh, putting retailers' focus squarely back on reducing their costs, uh, industry experts have said. And many are simply opting to take the hit from higher transport costs rather than risk hiking prices. Elsewhere, a strong U.S. economy and pushback from central bank officials uh, is leading some investors to rethink their bets on how quickly the Federal Reserve will cut rates this year, a shift that is rippling through Treasury and foreign exchange markets, even as stocks sit near record highs. Expectations that the Fed would ease monetary policy this year after its most aggressive tightening cycle in decades that fueled an explosive rally in stocks and bonds in the final months of last year, boosting the S&P 500 to an annual gain of more than 24%. Investors still believe the rate cuts are coming, but some have started to question when the Fed will begin lowering a borrowing cost and how quickly it will move. And while the S&P 500 has notched a fresh record high this month, Treasuries have paired some of the gains, and the dollar has perked back up as a result. But meanwhile, Chinese authorities have boosted messages of policy support in a bid to stabilize market confidence, underscoring the heightened concern to stem the rout in stocks. The nation's uh, state-owned enterprise watchdog on Wednesday promised to improve the quality of listed SOEs and to include the management of market capitalization and the performance review of the SOE executives. The China Securities Regulatory Commission held a meeting a day earlier and vowed to make every effort to maintain the stable operation of capital markets and to calm investors' nerves. Those are our top headlines at this international headlines at this hour. We'll take a quick break and I'll be right back with our next conversation. Join us again. On to our next conversation, South Africa's freight rail and port deficiencies are set to continue and businesses should brace for further supply chain challenges this year. But that's according to PwC in its South Africa Economic Outlook for 2024. According to the audit firm, in addition to the impact of international conflict on local companies, South Africa is also facing domestic challenges set to cause continued disruption in supply chains this year or specifically those involving rail and port logistics. Now, joining us for more insight on this is Chris Version, economist and senior manager at strategy at PwC in South Africa. Uh, he joins us for this conversation. Chrissy, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's just get right to it. We've seen government interventions in resuscitating Transnet in recent times to improve freight and port operations, but this sector uh, is still struggling to thrive. What are the issues and how widespread are they? in general, there's quite a few challenges. Uh, we think of road transport, uh, moving goods to the harbors, to the port system, where there's a decline in the quality of roads, there's an increase in the volume of trucks, uh, it's the cost of transport with fuel prices going up, it's about road safety. So that component, very challenging. Then we think about railways, for example, where at the moment the, the volume of goods being moved by rail is quite low at historical standards. Again, a combination of safety factors, the, the quality of service by, by the public sector, for example. Uh, that combination of transport from road and rail then feeds us into the port system, where over many years, as we've seen in lots of countries around the world, there's challenges with delivering port services in an ever-increasing size of ships. 
uh, the speed at which they need to enter, offload, move out. So there's a combination of the availability of skilled people, uh, equipment, for example, the impact of climate change, for example, weather type related events. So when you stack all of those up together, you get to a situation in South Africa at the moment where our transport and logistics system is under significant pressure uh, in terms of not only moving goods inside the country, but exports and imports as well. We are dependent on exports of minerals and manufactured goods uh, to earn money for the country. We are dependent on the import of uh, clothing and food items, for example, that consumers need to buy. So that's broadly the situation we are in, which we had at the end of 2023, and which many observers are saying could probably be with us for quite some time until there are real solutions. Well, speaking about solutions, Transnet's equipment shortages is another key issue. Can the government afford to allocate additional funding or perhaps explore a public-private partnerships to address these shortages and ensure adequate maintenance of exist existing infrastructure? We, we've seen quite a few questions around the funding of public corporations, state-owned enterprises, as we move towards the next fiscal budget being released in about a month from now. And we are looking at this fiscal budget as one that is very constrained from a revenue perspective. Our economy is growing quite slowly. And at the same time, we cannot really cut on spending because South Africa is such a large, uh, as we call it, a social component to spending, healthcare, education, also direct social transfers to households and individuals. So we've got a very constrained fiscal situation that doesn't leave much money for the government to to be able to give finance and funding to state-owned corporations. Already a big amount of money is being used by ESCOM, the local power utility. So there isn't much room, to be very honest, for government to do more in, in support of public corporations when it comes to railways, port, for example. And then we think of options like public-private partnerships. It's something that South Africa has been looking at uh, over the past decade or two, and there are some examples of where public and private sector work together. We even see that the cooperation between government and the public sector has increased since COVID-19 arrived, a stronger, more effective relationship between public-private. But the challenge is implementing that, obviously. And we know that there is already uh, an agreement in place for the Port of Durban to get more private sector involvement. It's the biggest port in South Africa, the biggest port in Southern Africa. So there are knock-on effects deeper into the continent impacting Botswana, Zambia, Malawi, for example, if we cannot resolve this. So it's a tricky situation. There isn't really money going around that can really help solve this. So we actually need resolutions and, and solving this problem without necessarily money being the answer. Tricky indeed. Now, in, in, the, in the light of our escalating international conflict impacting shipping routes and the flow of materials, are there alternative trade partners that South African businesses can explore? Well, our biggest trading partners, firstly, it's, it's China. So exporting from Durban to China, uh, very much a direct route. Secondly, it's Europe and then also North America. Uh, these are big export partners when it comes to both our minerals and our manufactured goods. So we are very much dependent on being able to put products on a ship and move it to these destinations. Uh, we don't really use a lot of the, the routes that are currently under pressure in the Red Sea, for example. So that does help us to a certain extent. But that just removes some of the international challenges that we have. We also have to be cognizant of the fact that we as South Africa make use of a shipping industry that caters for clients globally. So even if we were to say that we don't really make use of some of the routes that are under pressure, all of shipping globally is being impacted by what's happening in certain areas in, in the Middle East and Eastern Europe, for example. So that means that in terms of the time involved in shipping and the cost involved in shipping, those effects filter throughout the whole industry. So South African companies shipping goods to Europe, they might be going on the west side of the African continent or far away from any specific conflict, but it's still it's a time and a cost. It's the availability of ships the availability of containers, and then the cost of actually moving those goods, which has gone up quite significantly, not only the past year, but over the past five years. So it's not an easy answer. It's not an easy way for South Africa to, to escape these challenges. 
even if we solve our own local challenges than the international ones combined. So it's really, it's, it's, it's a situation of many red flags that mm. will not be easily or very quickly solved, unfortunately. Mm. I was also thinking about, uh, I mean, still within the domestic sphere now, the erratic energy supply uh, still disrupting production and transportation. What renewable energy source investments can the country explore to mitigate these disruptions and perhaps reduce dependence on the current grid? I know that continues to be a difficult conversation in South Africa with all the outages, et cetera. But uh, what solutions will be, could potentially be key at a, at a time like this? So I think we can look at some good news from that perspective. Uh, the, the response from the private sector, so let's again think about mines, manufacturing, for example. The interest and the response to put up individual uh, power creating units, whether it is solar power or wind power, whatever it might be, the investment into that over the past 18 to 24 months has been very significant. So at the moment, we've got, in terms of power outages, load shedding, as we call it, which we have different stages that can be implemented. We are currently at a low stage of load shedding. If it was not for this investment by the private sector in renewable energy over the past year or two, we would have been at a much higher level, which would have been causing electricity interruption two, three, four times a day. So there's certainly already good news. We've been able to, to a certain extent, reduce pressure on the national grid by many businesses and also households looking at their own renewable energy investment. And then the question is looking at 2024 and further on from there, what's the next best option? We know government has recently launched a new uh, resource plan, which does look at a lot more renewable energy being implemented. So there's obviously certain bid rounds that need to happen. That does take time. The most immediate response that we can expect in the economy is probably uh, households that can afford it and businesses that can afford it to continue investing in alternative energy, whether they put up solar power and own it themselves or whether they get this via wheeling from a, a different service provider. But that is probably going to be at this moment and heading into the middle of this year, into the winter, where power demand is obviously more. That's the only way that we can expect load shedding to be uh, contained to a certain extent if there's enough con continued investment. And we've seen actually a slowdown, to be very honest. Second half of last year, slow down in the investment in, in solar power, for example, the imports of solar panel. Uh, we don't really manufacture these items. We have to purchase them from suppliers in China, some other Asian countries. So there's another element there. We need to import these goods, but we've got problems with logistics. Uh, the global impact of disruption causes our exchange rate to weaken. So there's, again, a long list of challenges. But I think probably at this point in time, our discussion on the energy situation, uh, specifically load shedding, is probably better than it was beginning of last year when we were at more elevated levels of, of power outages. And renewable energy has been the big role player there. Well, that is good news. Uh, let's talk about another part of the story, and that's perhaps the role of digitization. Now, that there's been an advocacy for government to implement uh, digitization initiatives uh, or streamline bureaucratic processes within its, its institutions to improve efficiency and reduce uh, delays for businesses. How important will these be in improving the sector? I think those are conversations that we see in many countries around the world because we've got access now to digital tools uh, moving towards even using AI as a way of improving public service delivery. It's not something that's unique to South Africa. We're seeing it in many countries. And it's always seen as a way of reducing time and cost. Uh, we know that there are international publications that look at how countries compare when it comes to, let's, let's call it paperwork and red tape and, and the amount of time you need to put in to comply with regulations. And I think in South Africa, there is certainly room for that as well, whether it is at national government level where you'd often have big companies interacting with licensing processes, or whether it as, is at a local government level, as we call it, much more at a city and a town level, where individual households and smaller businesses, they interact with local government when it comes to applications for certificates, for licenses, the payment of public services. I think there's room to use that. We just have to be aware that while the technology is growing, at a significant speed, it's also about whether people can use it. And in a country where we have significant inequality, as we see in many other African countries as well, it's about people having access to the skills and the technology to actually use it. 
So it's great to implement a technology solution, but if you are situated in a town where many people don't have access to a smartphone or an internet connection, right. then it's not really something that could work. So definitely something to look at in 2024. I think there's room for, for using technology to, our, to a great extent. We will be keeping our eye on the sector. Christy, thank you so much for talking to us today. Appreciate the time uh, you spent with us today. Christy Vision, economist and senior manager at strategy at PwC South Africa. Well, that's it on this uh, edition of Business Edge. Remember to follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. From the team and I, it's bye for now. Mm -hmm.